lecture 22 should be understood by you in a very uh, special way. Here, post-reformation is the turning point. It's a post-reformation is the turning point uh, toward liberalism. You know, today's uh, liberal theologians came out of this post-reformation period. In other words, after the Reformation, society has been greatly changed in every aspect, in every aspect. Here, uh, in, the, in the Christian community, uh, among those Christian scientists, Christian philosophers, okay, got influenced by what we called enlightenment. Enlightenment. Enlightenment means, you see, enli enlightenment means what? Lightening. So you're opening your, your eyes, uh, opening your thinking. Okay, new idea came in every areas of, in, in disciplines. In other words, in science, in philosophy, even biology, even politics, economy, and so on. Okay, new idea came right after the Reformation. That's why I told you that is a turning point. Reformation was a turning point, okay? In regard to, in regard with Christian, Christian doctrines, of course, because of the dramatic changes uh, occurred uh, right after this Reformation, uh, Christian community has been influenced by these changes, these changes. Here, that we call enlightenment is a new opening our eyes. Here, as we discussed, is a post Reformation enlightenment. We discussed this Bible translation first because of the Bible translation. New spiritual eye opening. New spiritual eye opening occurred among the Christians, particularly those Christian leaders and scholars. Okay. Uh, as a result, historical premium was reversed. Restore, we, 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 we've learned that. Okay, reverse of historical premium among those minority people. Now, that's the first uh, enlightenment. Second enlightenment, right here, scientific method and procedures. Uh, it's a new way of viewing, looking at, interpreting uh, matters and societies and all the you know, uh, circumstances, okay? Now, they begin to analyze and interpret in a scientific way. Scientific way, science uh, came into being. Now, there are eight distinctive procedures, procedures uh, in the area of scientific, scientific method and procedures that you should uh, you should memorize this okay when we talk about scientific okay means this first first procedure is this you observation you look at the events you look at the matter 
you look at closely first. After you observe, you look at that, then asking questions. Why it happened? See, questioning, raising questioning is very crucial. Even we've been studying the biblical truths by way of raising questions many times as I have approached. So now, observation and always you're asking questions. Why? Why? And after raising questions, then you are gathering information. All kinds of information in order to answer those questions. Gathering information, gathering data. Okay? And after you gather data, information, then number four is very important. You forming a hypothesis. You know meaning hypothesis? You just open your I can't explain that. You you just uh, just uh, you 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 look look at your, your dictionary, your own language. Okay? You you hypothesis. Then you test the hypothesis. Hypothesis means if. Then after you testing, experimenting hypothesis, then making conclusion. After you make conclusion, then you report this in a written form. After reporting, then always evaluate it, whether that is really performed or not. So evaluation is a feedback. You know feedback? Always feedback. Like even our seminar like this, I always feedbacking whether this seminar is valid or effective, whether this is working or not. Let me say again, scientific method and procedures always has at least these eight steps, step by step. Okay, now, the father of this science is a very famous man here. This is right after the Reformation he was born here. Can you see that? Year 1561. Francis Bacon is an Englishman. He is a man of father of modern science. Okay. Now, that's the second part. Bible translation helped eye-opening. And also, scientific, scient scientific way of observing the matters. The second essence, second part for eye-opening. Okay? Now, third way of eye-opening is this. is a reasoning. We call that age of reason, reasoning. Reasoning means that it's a philosophical, so philosophical way of uh, understanding the matters. That's a scientific way. That is philosophical way. Philosophical way. Philosophical way is this. Always that philosophical way, all these philosophers at that time, from time from 16th century all the way to even 20th century, these philosophers, I, 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 I wrote down their names here. Those are the typical uh, famous philosophers who happen to be Christians. The, all Christians from England and Germany. The theologians also 
philosophers. Okay? So you are semi theologians and philosophers too. You are as a pastor. Now, these people, a, a philosophical way of observing and interpreting any truth, any matters, is this. Always, you look at me here, always you raise a doubt first. Doubt. Okay? Don't trust right away. Always doubt whether that is true or not. Okay? Then, it, skepticism. Skepticism means it's a doubt. Always not trusting. Okay? Skepticism. It's the same word. Doubt and skepticism. Now, these people, these philosophers, they influenced Christianity by way of raising doubt and skepticism over Christian truth. There was a very crucial change. Those Christian philosophers, okay, after they have learned scientific method and procedures, okay, their thinking has been changed toward toward the Bible. Okay, toward the Bible. Whether that Bible is truly written by the Holy Spirit and God, okay. However, they said, well, the Bible was written by human. Okay? And they have found out many errors and mistakes. Okay? And it depends on what, uh, what manuscript you refer to. Oh, some manuscript said this, some manuscript said this, and Oh, there are all kinds of uh, differences among those uh, Bible uh, manuscripts. So they raised up doubt about whether the Bible is a true Bible, true God's written book or not. Okay? And they raised up skepticism. This is what we call here... Um, you write down by it's a biblical higher criticism. You have to memorize this word. Okay? Biblical higher criticism. That's a that's a, a theological a modern theological terminology. Biblical higher criticism. That means they criticize the Bible by way of raising questions and doubt after, after learned scientific method and procedures, okay? And they put that into their practice that, wow, let's all look at Bible. Bible, we have found many errors and, errors and mistakes and wrong writings and different writings and so on. Therefore, whether that is a true word of God or not, they raised up questions and doubt. Okay? That we call it biblical higher criticism. Are you with me? Biblical higher criticism. Then they they begin to deny. This is a denial of infallibility of the Bible. See, you, you have to memorize this, this terminology. Infallibility. Would you, would you pronounce after me? Infallibility. Infallibility. In other words, you know the... F no error. Right then, the infallibility means no error, no mistake of the Bible. Okay? They deny that. 
they deny infallibility of the Bible. Infallibility means no error, no mistake, 100% perfect. That's infallibility. Okay? They deny it. They deny that Bible has error and mistake. It depends on you know which version you you refer to. You see, the Bible is not truly hundred percent word of God. That what we call biblical higher criticism. Okay, don't forget that you teach that to your people. Okay. These kind of things, okay, because of that, they gave up, giving up theocentrism. Theo means God. Centritism is a, it's a centering God. In other words, theo means God. Center, center means a center, okay? In other words, God is his only God, his only divine God, and his word is only word of God, and so on. Bible is only his word. Okay? So everything centers on God. It's a theocentrism, we call it. It's a, it's a theological language. Okay? They gave up theocentrism and they adopted, adopted. Humanism. Humanism. Humanism means what? Man centered. Human centered. Human centritism. So now, write down, okay? They said this we human, we are created in the image of God. Genesis 126. We are Created in the image of God. Therefore, we are God delegated his authority over human. Because now we are created in the image of God where we now have God's image. We human. Therefore, human is the, the primary being over God. So our God is, is not with us. He is in heaven. So we call it, they call this absentee God. You know, absentee means what? Not in the presence. Absent. So, God is absent from here. He is in heaven. So we call it absentee God. Okay? So now, whatever matters, whatever things, human is responsible for all the things and events happening in this world. It is humanism. Therefore, human is valuable. Human decision is valuable and powerful, authoritative, and responsible. So we are responsible for making our own destiny and decision as opposed to God, who is absentee God, no longer with us. He delegated all authority and power over human. We Christians. So we are, we have been given the free will, human free will. So our will is a primary instrument in making our decision over any matters. As a result, we are responsible for all our actions and not God. That's, that's the, what we call 
human responsibility even over the salvation. So this we call all humans are created in the image of God. Okay? All human, regardless of their religion, religion or background, all human is created in the image of God. Therefore, they are they are potential children of God. Okay? Potential, I would say, potential children of God. Now, how can you determine for child of God, how can you, how can you receive salvation? Because in other words, God has given every human opportunity to be saved. All human, regardless of their religion, they are destined to receive salvation. However, it's a human responsibility to grab the salvation. In other words, you are responsible for receiving the salvation by way of exercising your free will. So you are responsible because you are free will. God has given you free will. Therefore, you have to exercise your free will. That is what we call universalism. Universalism. Okay? Everyone has a chance to be saved. But provided that, provided that, you should exercise your free will toward Accepting Jesus as the saving God, Savior. That's universalism. Okay? The conditional upon your free will exercise toward in favor of Jesus, this salvation gift. But this universalist, okay, these people started with this universalism. Okay, as opposed to Calvin's predestined, Calvin's predestined. In other words, Calvin's, you know, predestined, predest, predestinations. Predestination means it's a Calvin. Write down. Calvin's pre doctrine of predestination is this. God has chosen people even before the creation. Before the creation, God has in his divine predestinations in, a, in his in his divine sovereignty, sovereignty power, okay, sovereignty power had chosen his own people before the creation who are very minority, uh, opposing to, as opposed to majority people. So very small number of people are chosen people by God as God's children. Okay? So those chosen people will, by the help of the Holy Spirit, will respond positively to the gospel. Okay? Because they were, they've been, they were chosen sometime in their life will respond positively, respond positively toward the gospel because they 
They were chosen. That's a Calvinism. Now, in opposition to the Calvinistic salvation doctrine, these people here, these people came up with universalism. Okay? These people came up with the universalism where all humans are chosen for salvation. Conditional upon, conditional upon what? Their free will exercise positively toward the gospel. In other words, you have to say yes to the gospel. Then you will be saved. Okay? Otherwise, no salvation. Although you were chosen. In other words, you are responsible for the salvation by way of exercising your free will. Here, these people here, so-called liberal theologians who came up with this kind of ideas until here, John Hicks, Okay, John Hick, this man, he is a modern, is a modern man. He's in 1922 and he died at 2012. He's an American theologian. He had developed so-called the terminology, so-called religious pluralism. Religious pluralism. You have heard that, right? He developed religious pluralism. See, religious pluralism is different from universalism. You see, religious pluralism is this. Regardless of your uh, religious background and regardless of your free will exercise, okay, no need for free will exercise. You just, as a human, you are children of God. Therefore, all human, regardless of their free will exercise, will be saved. So all human, with no respect of your religion background, will be saved. 100% of human will be saved. That's the religious pluralism. So now we've got three levels of salvation part here. Calvinism, predestination. Calvinism is, is what? Only chosen people will be saved. Okay? And Holy Spirit will, 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 will influence those chosen people's free will to exercise toward the gospel. So it, by the grace of God, it's grace. So always they are using grace. By the grace of God, those chosen people will exercise their free will, responding positively to the gospel. Okay, that's uh, only chosen people will do that. Now, over here, universalism is what? All humans are predestined to be saved, conditional upon exercising their free will. Otherwise, no salvation. You have to positively demonstrate your free will toward the gospel. Are you with me? Yeah. That's universalism. Okay. Now, 
From there, it jumped over there. Okay? Religious pluralism. Now, it's, a, it's a, over all human salvation, regardless of your free will and religion background. Are you okay? Now, now, now we are in the era, in the era of this religious pluralism today. So these people hate who? These people are very strongly in opposition of Calvinistic people. You, you Calvinist, Calvinistic, you, you Calvinism guys, you are very narrow-minded. Okay, you are very fundamentalist. You are against the human rights. Now, these people, these people are theocentric people. It's right. I, I put down here theocentric people. God-centered people, at least these two guys. But this is very strongly theocentric people. Okay? A second level. But over there is not theocentric people. They are what? They are human, humanistic people. These people. Human-oriented. Now, you see, after Reformation... Calvin, Calvinism arose and universalism was a, you know, you know, Armenianism? Armenianism, even Wesley, Wesleyanism, it's Armenianism and, and the Wesleyanism all relate to universalism. Okay, now these people, all these people, all that those guys got under the influence of this universalism, that theologians. Now, after that, they got, they moved toward religious pluralism. But those Calvinism people still hold Calvinistic the way of salvation even today. But these uni many majority universe universalistic people move toward the religious pluralism. So now today these Calvinistic peoples are minority. It happens here in our school, I'm teaching you Calvinism, right? So you are now obliged to accept the Calvinism. But it happens to, we, are, we happen to be a minority, minority. Now here, there are many a so-called liberal theologians. This man is a John Locke from England. A Locke, John Locke. He is a initial. After the Reformation, John Locke is a very famous guy. John Locke is the initial so-called liberal theologians who, stopped, who, who initiated. So John Locke is the initiator of liberal theology who happens to be an Englishman. Here, he was right here. Then his teaching transferred to Germany, his teaching. And these German people, all Germans here, Okay, Immanuel Kant got influenced by John Locke and developed liberal theology. And 
Georg Hegel and Frederick Schreimacher and Albert Wichel and Adolf Harunak and Walter Lausenbusch and Paul Tilly and John Hick. All these names okay, carry down up until now. So th these guys, these guys are very prominent liberal theologians who have developed today's liberal theology leading to religious pluralism. Now, our question is this. Why our God, Jesus, allow? Why our God, Jesus, did allow these liberal guys, I would say bad guys, okay, develop this kind of uh, liberal theology, uh, influenced quite a many Christian community people, and eventually uh, leading toward religious pluralism, and also we call it leading toward Antichrist. Why Jesus did not stop this? That is our question. Okay? Why today? Majority Christian community around the world have been influenced by all these guys' teachings and dominated by these guys' teachings. Now, full of Antichrist spirit all over the world today. In the meantime, evangelicals are very minority not strongly influencing Christian community, they have been underdog as opposed to these people. Why? I'm going to tell you later why. Okay? Now, let me just repeat again here. After the Reformation, after the Reformation, Enlightenment movement arise. Then have a fruit of this which is the, under the God's divine plan where I will, I will teach you later about this more in detail. But you should know how after the Reformation, how this enlightenment helped in, in promoting, developing this liberal theology up until now. May God bless you. Let us, let us, let us discuss more uh, in regard to all these uh, issues. I hope this will help you. In Jesus' name, amen.